that he yields. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you. So, Dr. Panu, what are the current barriers to bioterrorism and how might they be lowered by advances in AI and synthetic biology? Thank you for the question, Chairman. There are a few different ways that these barriers could be lowered that the field is tracking. One that I mentioned previously is uh, large language models providing expert biology knowledge to users that don't otherwise have that knowledge. That's referred to as uplift, and the frontier models that uh, frontier AI companies that develop those models are working on implementing safeguards for that. The other way that the barriers are being reduced is the um, expertise needed to use biological AI models to design novel pathogens or toxins. There is also the barrier of the digital to physical divide, which is something that gene synthesis screening addresses. Those are protocols that uh, prevent delivery of those pathogens or toxins to users, and policies to ensure gene synthesis screening is mandatory would be beneficial there. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Mc Mr. McKnight, uh, to my knowledge, an AI-enabled biological threat has not been developed. Uh, can you tell me how easy it would be to use AI-enabled technology to create a biological threat? I think the important thing is that our adversaries or groups that seek to do harm understand the impact that biology has had and, has ha and does have on societies. So the incentive, as we increase capabilities to create novel pathogens or modify natural pathogens, the incentives to use those capabilities to reduce the economic, political, and social will of America, as we've evidenced through the results of the pandemic, continue to increase attendant with the technical capabilities to do so. Unless we take and create a significant deterrence architecture, which we have done in other domains, the idea that those, uh, the advantage of using those capabilities is real. And what I mean by that is today, if somebody were to do something, we have an inability to detect that and do attribution of where it came from. So there's an inability for us to truly, with unity, hold somebody accountable for using these capabilities. And then secondarily, with our response infrastructure, unless we continue to invest in our response infrastructure, they will see an opportunity to impact our nation. So the two things, detection so that we can find who did it, and response so that we can show it won't work, are the two critical things to mitigate what is a really expansive area of innovation that is hard to, to our point previously, hard to regulate every piece of it, especially when the actors that seek to use these technologies are outside of our regulatory sphere. Thank you for that. It's just amazing the, what can be done, isn't it? It's, it's scary and it's, it's also exciting in, in terms of what can be done to be helpful with it. So uh, Dr. Diggins, what steps, talking about uh, exciting area of DNA synthesis, what, what steps could be taken in DNA synthesis operations that would make it harder for a threat actor to obtain dangerous DNA? Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chairman. So, we uh, first would be mandating synthesis screening as a, as a uniform practice across all providers in the country and restricting federal R&D funds so that we capture international providers as well. What you don't want to do is to drive the customer base to use international companies who intentionally don't screen their order systems. Um, the, the second would be to begin to build data sets and models that can predict when an arbitrary protein sequence can uh, create some form of harm. Right now, much of our defenses are built around looking for known pathogens and toxins. And these AI biodesign models allow us to kind of step back from that and to generalize the idea of uh, how does a protein cause harm? And we're not very good at that right now. And so this is, I think, a really important role the federal government can play to develop those data sets and models that can generalize that uh, detection response. Okay, thank you. And Mr. McKnight, how do we protect sensitive biological data sets while supporting open scientific research? Thank you for the question. This is a, a very critical one. The reality is today, uh, we need to generate more biological data first. Protection is a, is a critical component of it. Um, but without the amount of data we need to focus on developing good solutions to counteract adversarial development, we are, we are actually in an imbalance of, uh, of data protection today. But then very directly to the question, 
we need to treat, treat bio, biological data with the same privacy restrictions that we treat our most sensitive data, both in the national security community on the intelligence side uh, and also uh, as it relates to human privacy. Thank you. Thank you. My time's expired now. You're back.